Okay, the next item is differentiated accountability. This is really broken into three parts, so we're going to take it in a couple of chunks. Uh, the first one that's probably got the most uh, <coughs> detail and most of the, the, what we have spent the most time discussing with the stakeholder group is the accountability. And just to put it in a frame of reference, this is slides 14 to 35. Differentiated rewards will be slide 36 through 37, and support will be 38 through about 42 or so. So you can see the weight on the accountability is huge. So we're going to spend some concerted time kind of walking through what our thinking is now. And this is the one where I mentioned earlier, we changed significantly uh, from the technical assistance meeting to where we are now with where our thinking was. So, Joseph? There are um, three, there are actually four approaches that the U.S. Department of Education is take, has asking us to take. They're asking us to take three norm referenced approaches to um, accountability and then one criterion referenced approach. Uh, the difference is the norm referenced approaches really look at how our school is doing compared to each other. And the criterion referenced approach looks at how our school is doing compared to a, a particular set standard. So the first, um, the first norm reference approach is we have to design a method to identify priority schools. Priority schools, this is intended to identify persistently low achieving schools. And we have to identify a number of schools that is at least equal to 5% of the Title I schools in the state. We also have to design a method to identify focus schools. And this is, identify, this is intended to identify schools with the largest achievement gaps. So the idea is lowest achieving schools, largest achievement gaps, um, those are norm reference kinds of words. Um, we have to identify a number of schools that is at least equal to 10% of the Title I schools in the state as focus schools, those with large achievement gaps. We also have to identify, a design a method to identify reward schools, which is intended to identify high achieving or high improvement or, or schools that are improving at high rates. We have to identify of these at least a number equal to 10% of the Title I schools in the state as well. So those are three new types of um, accountability systems that they want us to put in place. The last one is a criterion reference approach and it is to design an AYP replacement. Um, there are a couple of things that this must do. It must retain a subgroup focus so that we don't lose um, our focus on our lowest achieving students. It must retain a safe harbor provision so that schools, if they don't meet the original target, can meet this kind of um, AYP replacement targets through some other means. And it needs to implement rigorous yet attainable targets. And um, all three of these, I think, are things that have challenged us, and uh, we'll talk about how we're trying to meet those as well. So for priority schools, again, intended to identify persistently low achieving schools, our current thinking is that we would simply take the bottom 5% of the top to bottom list. A couple of benefits from that. One, it aligns with our current methodology, and it results in persistently low achieving schools being priority schools, so that we're aligning our systems. Any questions on that before we move to the next one? <laughs> OK. Um, This gets to, I, if you want to pass on this or take it offline, that's fine. We can do that if that makes the most sense. So let me turn this on. Um, I was, so I was reviewing the PLA list the other day and the top to bottom list, just comparing the two. Um, specifically, uh, noticed that Karsten's Elementary Middle is a um, school in Detroit that um, historically has scored pretty well on the MEEP. Um, uh, boy, now let me let me try and remember this. It did, yeah. So it's been through a couple of changes, but I think the school code has stayed the same throughout. I mean, I actually went back and tried to track it. Um, man, I don't remember why it was so. I, my recollection now, and I could be wrong on this now, my recollection is that it was um, uh, low ranked on, it was on the PLA list, uh, which I would have thought it would not have been based on its uh, meet performance. Um, but 
You know what? I will take it offline. Let me go back and figure out what the heck I was looking at, and then I will email you, and we'll talk. We'll talk about it that way. How about that? But I think the broader point that we would describe ourselves is these inconsistencies pop up all kinds of problems for us. I mean, the most extreme one I think I mentioned once is we have one school that's in the top 40 percent of the top to bottom list, but is is considered under the Fed stuff a. Uh, so-called bottom five percent. So th this is really our way of saying that let's disconnect that confusion and uh, and go with this richer metric. Maybe one other quick question then. Uh, so I is there any concern that the that the top to bottom list itself uh, would that the methodology for calculating it would need to be changed in order to satisfy the folks at the Department of Ed? No, we don't have any concerns that we would have to change the methodology for top to bottom. So we, we would be, uh, our current thinking is to simply propose the current top to bottom methodology as the way to do this ranking that is now required, um, and then simply take the bottom 5% of that. Um, it does have one additional um, benefit, which is not on here, and that is that uh, school, this is the way that school improvement grants are also put out, and if we get this waiver, then this results in priority schools being persistently low achieving schools and school improvement grant schools, those that are eligible for school improvement grants. So it kind of puts all three of these systems into one. Focus schools, again, a uh, reminder of the requirements. It's intended to identify schools with the largest achievement gaps. Our current thinking is our approach is to calculate an achievement gap as the, as the average achievement of the top 30% of students in a school minus the average achievement of the bottom 30% of students for each tested content area, aggregate across all tested subjects, sort schools on that size of the achievement gap, and then identify the 10% of schools with those largest achievement gaps. Um, a couple of benefits. This does align with the current top to bottom methodology. And another one is this re reduces some of the complexity. If we were using, if we were talking about the traditional subgroups here, we would have to do something along the lines of um, finding schools that have, all the schools that have a black-white achievement gap, for example, and then sorting them on that black-white achievement gap, and then finding all the schools that have the Asian-white achievement gap, or all the schools that have students with disabilities, non-students with disabilities. So it becomes a very, very complex process. What this does is it really simplifies the process. And one thing it also does is it assures that all schools have the gap. So, so that right now, there are many schools that don't even have a subgroup. No schools actually have a subgroup. 700 schools don't have a subgroup simply because they're small. So the lowest achieving students in those schools really get masked because they're not a part of one of these traditional subgroups. What this means is that we ex essentially have a subgroup in every school where we can look at the low achieving students in every school. So since 2001, schools have been held accountable on overall student performance and on the performance of the nine traditional subgroups. This has put the focus on achievement of all students as defined by demographic characteristics. Um, again, that was if you had enough students, if you had enough students to form a subgroup. Again, at least 700 schools did not have a subgroup aside from their white subgroup, which was their all student subgroup anyway, in the 2010 and 11 AYP. So one of our questions that we asked ourselves on how are we going to do this subgroup analysis, how are we going to focus on low achieving students is, has this method of focusing on subgroups closed the achievement gap? And if you look at our percent proficient in math on the MME, you can see that for the all students group versus the economically disadvantaged subgroup, we haven't really seen a closure in the achievement gap. All, bo both groups have gotten better over time, and this is based on the new cut scores. Um, all, all students and the economically disadvantaged subgroup have gotten better over time, but the gap hasn't closed. And you can look at the <coughs> ethnicity gaps as well. You can see that, uh, again, all student subgroups are doing better, but we're not, we're not closing that achievement gap. You can see the same thing in reading tending to do better over time, but that achievement gap remaining. Same with the ethnicity gaps in reading. Um, we tend to see the same types of um, gaps from year over year. So even though we've had this 
focus on subgroups since 2003, which was the first time we did the disaggregated reporting for, a, for adequate yearly progress, um, we have not seen those gaps really close. So before we go into the third category of schools, reward schools, um, any feedback, insights about this way of doing the, the, the achievement gap? Uh, would you still be able to disaggregate by race? Yes, we would intend to report by race, ethnicity, economic disadvantage, non-economically disadvantaged, ELL, students with disabilities. So all of the traditional subgroups would still be disaggregated in the reporting. Mm -hmm. But for the accountability purposes, it would simply be saying, you need as a school to focus on your lowest achieving students, <coughs> whichever subgroup they're in. Okay. And just to add to that, when we get into the focus and the priority treatments and supports, then we would take that data and help the schools dig deeper into that sort of data in order to figure out what kinds of um, issues they need to address. Nancy, please, then Kathleen. focus of the beating the odds. Right, and then as Mike is alluding to, the beating of the odds. The beating the odds school. I mean, this is one reason we're trying to highlight those that have accomplished in a number of different ways student achievement, including reduction of the gap. But ultimately, I mean, this is, this is the, the beauty and maybe the disadvantage in some respect of the decentralized system. And, and ultimately, schools and teachers and leadership there needs to make decisions for themselves. This helps them understand better what that gap is and, and how to address their plans. There's, th there's one thing that I think needs to be brought up as well that um, we, in looking at doing focus schools this way, we, we looked at whether or not we would be simply disadvantaging high achieving schools because if, if you're high achieving, there's more room for a gap to be there. And what we found is that we do have several high achieving schools that end up being identified as having very large gaps, but we also see a lot of low achieving schools that have very large large gaps, and it, it tend, we also see several high achieving schools that don't have large gaps. So w we were able to come to the conclusion that in doing it this way, we're not simply disadvantaging high achieving schools simply because they're high achieving and there's more room to have a gap because there are lots of high achieving schools that don't have big gaps that don't get identified as focus schools as well. Nancy, then Cassandra. Um, I, I appreciate this very much. I like the, uh, rather than the either or, the both and pro, uh, uh, way of looking at this. I agree with uh, Dan that it would be a shame to lose all those subgroups, that it, that would be not what we were after. And it was reassuring to hear that you're not losing that, but you're adding, actually, another subgroup. Um, I came from a district and as a local school board member that would now fit in. Um, it would fit in today because we've changed our, our demographic, but at that time, it would not. Um, and one of the biggest challenges we had there was recognizing as a high achieving district that not every one of our students was high achieving and finding that to be a concern. And as a board, as a policy making board, as an administration, it was so easy when you had kids on the merit and the MEEP, well, we didn't have merit then, but the MEEP exams up in the 80, 90 percentiles year after year after year to ignore that, that seven, eight, nine percent of the students that were way, way below, not the next grade or even the further grade, but the bottom level. And so I applaud you for this because it really points out that every single district needs to look at every single student and help understand how it is they can help those children succeed, so thank you. Nance, if I may add to that before Cassandra, is just that this is why we really have taken a great stride towards a system of schools rather than a system of school districts. 
And if you think about it, I mean, I had 30 some schools as a local superintendent. We had eight title schools, and then we had a few very, very high performing schools. But the formulas for their improvement with this kind of data are totally different and unique. But you tended to try to do a one size fits all in those days in particular. So, I mean, it gets to a point where you can, you know, I had the image was of a district that we bordered Detroit that was unlike Detroit. Not so. We have schools that were exactly the same as Detroit schools. And, it, and this stuff started, if I may say, just even to me to some degree, started to give excuses to the adults in there because we kept focusing on this rather than drilling down. And these are just more and further opportunities to drill down and understand, including this last one, by the way, which was the focus on the rewards. But we'll get to that in a minute. I, Cassandra. Well, that's, I'm glad you brought that up because that's exactly what I was going to ask about. And this might be uh, something that you address later on, and if it is, then feel free to just move forward. But um, it reminds me of being in college and, and writing papers, and the professor would always, okay, so what's the so what? Um, you know, so you end up being a focus school. What does that mean? Is it, do you get benefits? Do you get penalized? Is there access to... Um, resources, or is it simply for information purposes? I mean, what's the point of having When we get the into label? the differentiated support, that's where we'll talk about okay, that. Thank okay, thank you. So if we don't address it, let us know. All right. Okay. Cool. Okay, so thank that's you. the, that, now we've got to get used to three new kind of categories of schools. So we've got the priority, which would be basically the, the persistently low achieving. We've just gone over the focus, which is really going to pay heed to the achievement gap. And the third one uh, is the reward schools, and then we'll do AYP. Joseph? Sure. Again, the reward schools, this is intended to identify high achieving or high improvement schools. Um, our current thinking is to take the top 5% of schools on the top to bottom list, unless they are focused schools. Um, take the top 5% of schools on the improvement metric, unless they are either priority or focused schools. And what we would do is we would identify improvement rates or four year slopes for each tested content area aggregate across content areas, sort by aggregate improvement metric, and then identify the top 5% of those. So it's taking our top to bottom me methodology and just reusing what we've already got going in the top to bottom methodology. And then a third way that we would like to propose to the U.S. Department of Education that you can become a reward school is if you are a school identified as beating the odds. We think that that, uh, that is a good idea. It's n they haven't asked for this, but we think it's a good idea to add it to the list. You can see it on that. <laughs> I had a little hard time reading that. <laughs> um, the benefits, again, this aligns with the current top to bottom methodology. It aligns with our current beating the odds methodology and it aligns with priority and focus methodology so that we're trying to build this coherent system of, um, of uh, accountability. Okay, then we go into AYP. So, Joseph? We get to design an AYP replacement. Um, the requirements, again, it must retain a subgroup focus potential with potential differences between accountable subgroups and reported subgroups. Again, getting to Dan's uh, comment about don't lose the reporting on, of those traditional subgroups. Um, we must implement ambitious and attainable targets, and that's a difficult uh, tension that we're trying to navigate. And we must retain a safe harbor provision. So our current thinking is the overall approach that we would like to give a red, yellow, green for each co tested content area, kind of a red, yellow, green for graduation rate, a red, yellow, green for completing and reporting educator evaluation, since that's now a requirement of the law, and a red, yellow, green for compliance that, it, for example, completing a school improvement plan, we don't want that to just go away. And an overall red, yellow, green for a school, the, the benefits of that is it gives simple, intuitive results. Um, that's kind of some of the feedback we've gotten to this point, but are eager to hear yours as well. So current thinking. Um, where we have been, again, achievement gaps have generally not closed. We need a different approach. We feel like we do need a different approach. And our approach to subgroups, again, is that the subgroup is your bottom scoring 30% of students in a school. So you have your whole school, you measure whether you're meeting targets for the whole school, and then you measure whether you're meeting targets for that bottom 
This puts the attention firmly on the lowest achieving students and by improving that group, you're going to, by definition, be improving the overall achievement of your school. So a couple of the benefits. The, what happens here is that the vast majority of schools, of schools would now have a subgroup if they tested at least 30 full academic year students over the last three years. And that gets almost every school in the entire state, except for some of these very, very, very small schools. Um, at least 700 schools have no subgroups, again, under the AYP traditional subgroups. One of the things this does is it unmasks low performance and high performing subgroups because we know that not every white student is a high performing student. We know not th that not every um, Asian student is high performing. Um, some of those students might be in that bottom 30 and we need to put the focus on those students as well. Some of the non-economically disadvantaged <coughs> students are going to be in that bottom 30. So some of the non-traditional groups would also have students that show up in this bottom 30. We, it asks that all schools consider their lowest performing students. You can't just ride on having high performance for most of your students if you have some pretty significantly low performing students as well. Um, in the lowest 30% subgroup, we do know from some of the data analysis that we've done that approximately 70% of that group are also a member of one of the traditional low achieving subgroups. So we're essentially capturing those students anyway but we're capturing a few more students as well in that lowest 30%. A couple of the drawbacks that we've seen to this particular methodology is that there is some concern that l we would lose, lose focus on those traditional demographic subgroups. We've tried to allay that concern by saying we will um, report on all of those traditional subgroups and once you see who's in your lowest 30%, you would be able to see what of those that are in my lowest 30%, what percentage are economically disadvantaged what percentage are Hispanic, what percentage are male, which percentage are female, and so on. Um, another drawback that we have heard is that high achieving schools typically don't like this because they're at more risk of showing up on a, uh, on a negative list, simply because now we would be looking at some of the low achieving students in some of these higher achieving schools. I wanted to add, yeah, pause please. for some feedback on this particular issue. Uh, on slide 24, uh, under requirements, mm -hmm. uh, so I'm actually curious of this requirement. So must retain a subgroup focus. Is it also a requirement that um, there be a potential difference between accountable subgroups and reported subgroups? No, no, that's okay. not a requirement. That is simply allowable. There are other states that are doing similar things to this and have submitted theirs to the federal government. Okay. Richard and then Eileen. I, I'm sorry, Dan, if you weren't complete. I have... Um, uh, explain what uh, safe harbor, uh, what, what's the real idea behind safe harbor concept? Okay, uh, we haven't gotten there yet. We will get there in a, in a couple of slides. Um, okay. I can wait. Okay. Eileen, please, and Cassandra. Um, I had the chance to bring up uh, expulsions and suspension rates with uh, Secretary Duncan, and um, I, I believe from what I saw of the conversations between NCES, IES, and USDOE that they're very worried about it, and it's just you know one of those things that everybody's starting to think about. I wanted to ask within the AYP replacement model, I, I, when we had our school to pipeline uh, discussion, my understanding is that there is no state data that's usable. But I, I would like to say that just for the moment, if you could humor me and tell me whether there's any place for it in, in, in this area, because if we lose, uh, knowing what the stats are, three quarters of all African American males were suspended or expelled between sixth and, and twelfth grade in, in the NCES background questions, half of the girls were. And if they're not in school, or if they've dropped out by ninth grade, then all the things that we're doing here doesn't report on the kids who've already left the school. So I, I just, you know, it's sort of a moral situation, uh, not to mention educational one. It may not be in the requirements, but I'm asking from, you know, the larger picture. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's one reason why we are proposing that we keep graduation rate in the model because graduation rate is essentially the only data that we have that we've been able to gather that can get to that question. Um, so we are proposing that graduation rate remain in the model as one of those things that will get a red, yellow, green um, so that we can identify schools where there is a problem with the graduation rate with dropouts and so on. It won't help us with the suspensions, yeah. but it will at least help us with the graduation rate. Well, we 
we don't collect. Yeah, the suspension we don't collect. And it, of course, this is this is one of the Headley issues as we look for more thoughtful data over time that you know wasn't as clear to us 10 years ago and maybe is now but it, it isn't something that we should we should try to think about how we might be able to do that anyway even if it's I mean, the, pro the problem is once it's voluntary you get skewed data it's a problem for us the keep records of it. We do gather expulsion. CEPI does gather expulsion data, but not suspension data. If, yeah. if I can just quantify, yes. according to Secretary Duncan, uh, the only, they have it in two places according to NCES. I didn't catch what the second one is, but both of them said that they have it within the civil rights reports that are, that are generated, and they, they have a new one coming out, but everybody agrees it's not being tracked, and, and everybody agrees it better be. Uh, I don't know whether we have civil rights data or whether anybody... We, we should... Uh, we should check to be sure we'll maybe we have something we don't know we have on this uh, Cassandra's next but anyone else more on this topic just for a second while you you think Nancy did Dan did um, this may be a kind of a stretch but we've just had a new bullying law passed in Michigan it seems to me that suspensions and expulsions are going to um, increase and as a result of that law, we're asked to be able, if I recall correctly, we're asked to be able to report back what the effect has been. I'm paraphrasing here. And it would seem to me then that this is the perfect opportunity then to get that information tracked that we previously have not tracked. Even though that is talking about bullying, if you're going to talk suspensions and expulsions, why, and you have to track them for bullying, why not track them, period? So I don't know that that's something that we can or can't do, but it would seem to me that might fit in. Um, all that the bill requires in terms of data and reporting is that the schools report on their policies to us. It, there is not a reporting function in terms of incidents, who was bullied, what reason they were bullied. None of that was addressed in the legislation, so there won't be any of that kind of data. Shucks. Yeah. Are we uh, empowered to issue regulations or, or guidelines? Not, in the, not to exceed the law, not I think. Law, is. Can we exceed the law? We can't really exceed the law. And that would exceed the law. Would it exceed the law? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this was, I think, why one. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Well, if we can get this one this afternoon first, and then we can improve it. Yeah. On this topic, I think it was Dan and then Marianne. Uh, I don't, I don't want to belabor the point. I think it's been well made. Um, I just, uh, so it is a, uh, we talked about it last month. It is a um, increasingly glaring hole in the top to bottom methodology uh, for K-8s in particular, right? I mean, so we're tracking graduation rate for high school, but for those K-8 schools, um, I think it's just something that we're going to have to address, um, you know, in order for that list to, to maintain the kind of credibility that it currently has. Cassandra. Yeah, I, or wait, no, I'm sorry. But is this on that topic? Mm -hmm. Sorry, Mary. Uh, and I'd like to concur with my uh, colleagues here. Um, it seems a shame that uh, if, if we're collecting this data, say in freshman year of high school uh, and, and we're looking at graduation rate that we're not doing anything apparently in between and <coughs> can we look at that? Can we um, <coughs> try to capture maybe a, a best practice at, at a current school and, and put that uh, to work for some of these schools. I mean, we know we know where graduation rates are are very low. Um, we know where problems are. I mean, why why do we have to wait four years to uh, to say 
aha, here's a problem. Uh, but we unfortunately have no solution. We have the statistics, but we don't have a solution. And it seems by now we should have come up with uh, some sort of a solution. I put this to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think the closest that we've got to that is probably the dropout challenge has given us some data on best practices of what schools have done. But again, that's voluntary, so we don't have statewide data on that. Yeah, and where we have it, I mean, I don't know if, that, if we hooked you up with the PBS piece that Lisa Gallagher did on the, the news hour on the dropout challenge, but that that's really worked for the districts that have tried to identify these mm -hmm. kids very early, as you're Some inferring. Have. Yeah, we yeah. wish. You know, I'm wondering about the previous issue. I wonder if a letter from John on behalf of the board to all board presidents, uh, indicating that even though we can't because of Adair, Headley, and all that collect the data, we think it would be important for you to know your data on suspensions and blah, blah, blah. I mean, there's a way that we can still use your stature to suggest. And maybe that's part of the package <clears throat> in response to the discussion we had last month. You know, what are a set of things we could do that help but treat the expulsion, suspension, disciplinary issues that we raised? Is that might be a, yeah. an action or an yeah. expectation. Because it doesn't always mean we have to get it. What we really want is we want it where the action is anyway. And if they were mm -hmm. to do that, and, and in fairness, they just might not be thinking about it. I mean, we're spending a lot of time in drilling down. They're they're dealing with a budget cut and a labor contract, and a little thought about that could easily translate to most districts. Hopefully, saying, "Yeah, good, good point. We want that data for our own." On this point again, I am going to get to Cassandra. Oh, which very patient. <laughs> well, well, yeah. You know what? I don't know what point we're on either at this point. <laughs> but is on this point, please. Okay. Collected at so their own individual building. Yeah. So why yeah. can't they just send them to us? <laughs> because that's a headley violation. Yeah. yeah. But again, I think if we if we we can do it voluntarily, but that doesn't that as Mike was saying it skews the data. Yeah. Well, this might be part of a package that we invite local boards to think about, as John said, in a bigger package, and because uh, that's really where the data is going to be valuable. And besides, we can't enforce it. And then if we get it voluntarily, it's skewed. We don't really know, is that representative of the state? Is it, you know, people are going to volunteer it probably if they're doing well and maybe won't volunteer it if they're not. You know, I'm not. But having, having a good guide is, is part of it. Yeah. It's something uh, we can use to help others. Yeah, I think that's right. I think we could. I think Eileen on this topic, and then we're going to Cassandra. Sorry, I, I, I would like to uh, um, uh, have the board consider an ad hoc committee on this to try and come up with some solutions. Because if, if we have no data, which we don't, and the feds don't, although I trust me, um, uh, people are very concerned about it right now in a way I haven't heard before, then uh, if, in the amount of time it could take to put that together, it could be three to four years on a national level, and we have no ability to gather it. So. All we're left with is behavior modification for school practices. And I think that it would be valuable to try and put together a board model for it in some way. Um, and it, uh, obviously not enforceable, but whether we go to, you know, we've talked about best practices, trying to put things on the, on the internet, on the website. That there's a chance here to get more people thinking about it. When we heard what happened in the schools where, help me out, it wasn't, it's not distributive justice, it's restorative justice. When restorative justice or other programs are put in place, you can you can get this taken care of to a large degree, and it's worth it. Um, Blair Taylor, who's the CEO of the exec of the uh, Urban um, League in in, California, in Los Angeles, told me that when they at Nagby told me that when they uh, asked principals when they got data and they asked the LA principals about it, people said that they weren't aware of it at all. And I truly believe that that can happen, um, especially if you don't know what to do to fix mm -hmm. it. Yeah, good, good suggestion. I think Cassandra and then John. All right. Thank you for your patience. Um, 
So very briefly, I think, yeah, <laughs> if I can remember, um, <laughs> I've been waiting a while. Um, there are unintended consequences, obviously, to every decision that we make. And most of the time, a lot of the time, we don't even know what they are. Uh, one of the concerns of a potential unintended consequence that I see with this, and I'm hoping that you can uh, let me know if, if you've thought about this and, and how we could address it, would be that as we continue to focus on the lowest performing students in schools, are we doing that uh, in spite of, uh, say, gifted programs or the students who are doing the best and, you know, taking our focus off of uh, really enhancing those students um, to focus on students who are performing the least. I'm not saying that it shouldn't be a focus of ours, but not uh, in spite of gifted and talented programs and, and things like that. So how do we make sure that that doesn't become an unintended consequence of what we're doing? Yeah, that's, that's actually something that we have heard is that you would, uh, you might say, if I want to re reduce my achievement gap, I can keep my high flyers from flying so high. Um, and we've thought, actually thought a lot about wow. this. Um, <laughs> it's one, um, that's a pretty cynical view, <laughs> one. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> that's a kind. Uh, um, and the, the, the concern that we have is that it, in some ways, if we do retain a focus on low achieving subgroups, if we do retain a focus on low achieving students, there are going to be ways to game the system no matter how we put that together. If we have a focus on low achieving students, people will come up with those ideas. Um, so in some ways I, I look at that and I think that may be an unintended consequence and I'm not quite sure how to fix that. Um, but at the same time, can we afford not to have that kind of focus on our lowest achieving students at the same time. So it, we've been thinking a lot, and if, you, if there are ideas here on how we can address that, we want to hear them because I, I think it is, a, it is a serious issue that we need to address. Ideas on this point, sounds like. Nancy and then Eileen and Dan first, I think, on this question. Uh, how do I say this well? Um, Let me think about how to say this well. Come okay. back. <laughs> Eileen, try okay. to say it not so well. Just okay. Oh, I'm yes. sorry. It was Nancy. So, so here I'm just not going to even think about saying it well. I'm just going to say it. I'm going to let Dan really say it well. You know, folks, at some point, everyone in this system has to take personal responsibility. And if your biggest focus is figuring out how to game the system, I'm sorry, that is not being personally responsible. And our children deserve personal responsibility. Now, does that mean because I've said that or anyone else here at the table, which I'm sure all of you have thought that, that that's not going to happen? No. All I'm saying is that we cannot deter what we know to be the right thing to do because someone has not taken on personal responsibility. We can encourage, help, enlighten, cajole, whatever we want to do. But ultimately, it comes down to, is this in the best interest of all children? And if it is, we have to go forward. And if someone is going to try and get around that, then I'm sorry. I really wish they wouldn't, but it's the right thing to do. So that probably wasn't artfully or PC or anything else, but it is what comes from the heart. Even though this is out of turn, she waited so long before. <laughs> Cassandra's next, then Eileen, Kath, and Richard. I just want to clarify something from my, my comments, and, and thank you for you know, responding to that. I'm not talking about deliberately gaming the system. I'm talking about ending gifted and talented programs because um, they're no longer the focus. So I just wanted to clarify that. I wasn't talking about people deliberately not advancing students. I'm talking about students not advancing because the structure doesn't exist for them to advance. And if I made it to that point, just to that point for a moment, I, my experience, and I'm generalizing here, but my experience is parents of those students will not allow that to happen. It's normally the harder part for 
for interested parties on the kids that haven't been served. But I, I, it's a legitimate issue to get on the table and to keep talking about. But I've lost track. I think Eileen. Eileen, Kath, Dan. Cassandra, as, as somebody who has a passion for the visual and performing arts, I hear you. NCES has a study coming out in uh, the next month on 2000 and 2010 visual and performing arts to try and see whether they've been lost from the curriculum. I'm told that it's, that, that it's not as strong as I personally would like, but it's not bleak at all. But the real question is, we know ch I know two charter schools that have an incredible array of, I wouldn't call them gifted and talented programs. I would call it a broad curriculum, project-based, that allows every child to succeed at a pace that works for them and uh, with, with high rigorous achievement goals. I think of um, uh, two charters, and I'm sure that we all know a number of traditional schools. It's just that Henry Ford Academy and University Prep pop into my mind just because I've been there recently. But I would again say to the board, why don't we have a spot on our website that talks about what can happen and how people can do this well? Because if, 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 as long as there are districts that are concerned about this, they're not going to meet the needs. They don't know how to do it. So if we can show them examples of people who are meeting it, perhaps that will help. Kath, Richard, Dan, and then we're going to move to the next item. If we can. Uh, I think it would, it would help if we, in addition to recognizing the big being the odd schools, we also recognize the high achieving schools. And we can reward. Oh, and that's what the new category reward schools is. There were three. Because it wasn't just beating the odds, right? It was also the no. highest achieving and then the, high, the schools with the highest improvement rates over time. Right. Those so are the Kathy's reward point. schools. Yeah. So I think we've got them covered three ways. Yeah, I mean, I think last week, uh, Linda and Sally at the School Improvement Conference, it was well received, those that got the awards for uh, improving. And I think there are vehicles for that that reward excellence and reward improvement. And that's, uh, that's a slide coming up. Okay. I think it was Richard and then Dan and then Carolyn Curtin. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do have public participation. <laughs> no, I'm, that's horrible. R Richard, Dan. I, I just wanted to say a word of appreciation to my colleagues here that uh, uh, in, in doing some of the hard thought that goes into to setting up a structure that rewards the behaviors you want to see. And there are people who cynically game the system, but then most people just just do their little narrow part and without... Uh, uh, and, and, and unconsciously do what gets rewarded. And one of the things, I, I think that schools do face a priority, you know, well, am I gonna, you know, subsidize my, my gifted and talented students or am I gonna subsidize my, uh, my students that uh, are in need of help? And I, I think that since gifted and talented generally do have a lot of intelligent boosters behind them, uh, that it makes sense for the, for the, as we look at this process, that we, we want to incentivize schools to bring up their, their weakest students. So I, I think this all makes sense. So we, the devil is in the details. Yeah, thank you. Richard, or Dan. I'm good. But Dan's good. <laughs> Great. Carolyn, you have some privilege, I think, probably from. Well, not Thank you. Okay. 
Okay, so we're going to continue on talking about what this AYP replacement might look at. And these are some of the comments that Joseph was saying, that the tension between have, needing to be rigorous or the feds will not approve us, but also attainable or people will not think that they can make it. Joseph? Okay, this is a chart showing the distribution of, of um, career and college readiness in mathematics on the MME. With the new cut score. With the new cut score. So you can see we have a spike there at zero. We have a significant number of schools that have 0% proficient in mathematics on the MME given our new cut score. Uh, the 50th percentile is somewhere around 22, 23% of, of students being proficient. The, 90, the 95th percentile is around 50%. So just to give you some kind of background of where we are, where we're starting from, what we, what we see in the schools, what we know is observable at this point in time. In reading, it's a different story. The 50th percentile is somewhere around 50, 52% and the 95th percentile is somewhere around 75% per, proficient in the school. So we have a different story in math and reading and so we think we really need to be able to treat math and reading somewhat differently in this as well. Um, so how to set ambitious and attainable targets. Again, where are we now? Uh, career and college ready cut scores equaling proficiency. This creates a different distribution of proficiency statewide than we've had, had in the past. It creates a different uh, distribution of proficiency by subject area as well. So our current thinking is that we set up differentiated proficiency targets for each school based on the percent proficient necessary for that school to reach some overall target for proficiency in, in the future and then we set an improvement target. And the idea here is that we set targets that um, are essentially the first cut at AYP, this first cut at, at accountability. And then this improvement target is more, if the school doesn't meet that proficiency target, they can meet an improvement target instead. This is kind of our safe harbor approach. This is where safe harbor comes in, is that we're talking about if you don't meet that first target just on, a, on proficiency, if you're improving sufficiently over time, you can then meet the target instead on that. Could you repeat that? I know that was of interest to Richard on yes. earlier question. So the current thinking is we would set up differentiated proficiency targets for each school based on where they are right now and what they would need to do to get to a certain end goal in mind some, at some time in the future. But if they don't meet that uh, proficiency target, they can meet it through improvement. This is our, this is our take on safe harbor. So if you don't meet it on the proficiency target, you can over time because you're improving sufficiently over time, meet it on that, that safe harbor method of, of uh, getting to the target. And we want to set that an improvement target based on the increase in percent proficient demonstrated by a high improvement school in the base year. So essentially, what does that mean? That means this is where we're talking about attainable. We want it to be ambitious, so it has to be a higher improving school over time but it needs to be attainable so that we've seen some schools do this. So, for example, we might have a school A that has 0% proficient in mathematics, say, for example, and we know we have a lot of schools that do have 0% proficient. So what we would say is, okay, we're going to set, and we're just doing this for conversation purposes right now, for discussion purposes, is say 85% is what we want schools to get to. Um, we know that that 100% target under No Child Left Behind was a little bit unreasonable, maybe a lot unreasonable. Um, and so we set something that's not quite at 100%. And you look at that and you'd say, okay, the first year, school A, because you have 0% proficient, we're going to ask you to get to 8.5% in that next year. Now, one of the things that I can say is we've seen almost no schools do something like this over time. This is a really ambitious uh, set of goals for them to get to. So these, are the, these would be their proficiency targets. Let's say we have school B that has 50% proficient instead, and we would be saying, okay, you need to get to 85% proficient by 2022, <coughs> 10 years down the road. Their, their trajectory of their proficiency targets goes up at a slower rate. But let's think about uh, a school that Let's say, for example, even with differentiated targets, some schools are going to have to make substantial gains every year. For example, 8.5%. We're not sure we've ever seen a school do that. So the idea is, this is higher than we've seen demonstrated by the majority of schools. We need to set an improvement target 
two that is rigorous yet attainable. So this is our safe harbor. So the current thinking on safe harbor is in our base school year, we determine the rate of improvement demonstrated by a high improvement school. For example, a school at the 90th percentile. So if we were to see that a school at the 90th percentile um, had a 3.5% improvement rate, then this becomes our improvement target. So that you would just say over the last five years, over the last four years, have you seen a 3.5% improvement per year? Rather than getting to that achievement target, we're now looking at improvement as our safe harbor metric. So that uh, if you don't make it just on that proficiency target, um, you can make safe harbor by, making, by achieving that improvement target over time. Yes? Was that, is the percentage that low, uh, three, Yes, in, we do have um, that kind of improvement rate is statistically significant and it's about the 90th percentile right now. So that is what we're seeing the highest improvement schools doing. Um, any additional comment before we go on to kind of our color scheme? We can loop back around after you see the color scheme. Okay. So we, you're seeing something different than our previous stakeholders have seen. Um, in, the previous, in previous stakeholder meetings, we looked at green being kind of rare, red being kind of rare, and a lot of yellow schools. We got a lot of feedback that says, well, wait a minute, make the red be a real, you're not doing well, a yellow be kind of a caution, and lots of schools being green. We think that that makes some sense. So what we would do to set in each content area, you would be green if your all students group met the proficiency target and your lowest 30 group met the proficiency or the improvement target and you had 95% participation. We think that it is really important to keep that participation rate in the accountability system. Simply because if we don't, it's really easy to cherry pick which students don't take the test. Uh, it's not, it is not specified in this AYP replacement um, guidelines under flexibility, we think it's really important to keep. Um, you would be a yellow in a certain content area if your all students group does not meet the proficiency target but does meet the improvement target. Essentially, if your all students subgroup makes, if your all students group makes safe harbor, then you become yellow. You're kind of in danger of falling into not making AYP. <coughs> Your lowest 30% group meets proficiency or the improvement target, and again, the school meets the 95% participation target. You would be red if your all student group misses both the proficiency and improvement target, or your lowest 30 group misses both the proficiency and improvement target, and your school does not meet, or your school does not meet the 95% proficient target. Any one of those three could uh, put a school into red on, the, on any given subject area. So for here's an example of a green school. We would talk about a school being overall green if no more than two, if it has no more than two yellows and doesn't have any reds. Essentially, you could be green. Even if you have a couple of yellow subject areas, you could be a green overall school simply because the majority of what you've done is, is in the green. We would talk about a school being overall yellow if it has no more than two reds. You might have a red. You might have two reds in there, but the majority is yellow, so you could be overall yellow. And you would be overall red if you have more than two reds on your, essentially, your scorecard here. Um, our current thinking you know, also... Go back to the visual just for a second. Yes. This is just a plant of thought that, you know, as we, as we refine our thinking and our process issues like this, it's probably we're thinking at some point is what does accreditation mean or not mean in a, in a world if we're approved under this kind of system? You know, is there is there more clarity with this? The visuals are what I'm really getting at. Your parent or your teacher or you're someone interested in the, the depth of measurements in your school. If we were to get this waiver approved, it may be that we've we we. we give a different thought to what we think about with respect to accreditation so that we, we still try to align systems and not have multiple things hanging out there. But not to answer today, just to kind of have a backdrop. Who's, um, I wanted to ask this before, I saw some states or states or communities are using this red, yellow, green. Who is it? And I guess the question is making sure if they're using it, is it working famously, successfully 
to be that user-friendly guide, and I'm all for aligning uh, our accountability structures to be aligned and commonsensical. Um, I think Georgia is using, I'm not sure which other ones, we've kind of divvied them up to read, so we're not reading all 11, but Georgia's used it, but they also have flags in addition to theirs, so there's got a little bit complicated, but they were at the technical assistance meeting. That's when we really heard for the first time that people were taking AYP and turning it upside down. I mean, so this really is a whole different way of looking at it. So I don't know that they've used this uh, that much, so we don't know if they've been successful in it. I don't know if they've implemented it. I don't yeah. think they've implemented it yet. They're talking about implementing yeah. it. Somebody at your excellent schools Detroit before you were in charge was using a system like this, one of those communities or states. If I recall correctly. You know, I think if I could just add to kind of this thinking and maybe the rethinking of accreditation and aligning, you know, I think what we get closer to those of us who maybe had medical issues or stuff, when, when you, you, the last thing you want are confusing metrics. And, and the greater clarity you can have. I mean, in medicine, it's often you're out of a range, you're in a range. I mean, even a simple blood test or whatever, it might be you're within a range or you're high or you're low. I mean, these are things that if people, something as important as health, if they've managed to get it to fairly, fairly um, understandable uh, metrics, uh, even if it's not a good metric, you know, even if you'd prefer to have a different metric. I mean, I think, I think this thinking starts to get us to a different way of thinking about what we were doing specifically, let's say, on accreditation. But I think it's one way or the other, it's the beauty of presenting to schools a real understanding, like a medical diagnosis might do, do with testing, a clear understanding of what's really going on. And the ultimate purpose not being for penalties, the ultimate purpose being for how do we deal with our lost achieving kids? What is it about that gap that we, we need to reconcile? You know, and, and, and do it in a way, because most teachers and principals and administrators, are, they're gonna, sometimes when we're in these, we forget that the overwhelming number want to do the best for their kids and with the right data are gonna develop uh, tactics to get there, school improvement plans, et cetera. So, these just give much more uh, concreteness, really, to what it is a district or a school rather needs to do. Sally, I'm sorry. Mark, what? Um, we also have to have an approach to district accountability. AYP, as it currently exists, there is a very different schema for holding districts accountable than for holding schools accountable. We think that it would be much better for us to have an exact replica of school accountability at the district level so that we're holding districts and schools to exactly the same levels of accountability. So that concludes just the one section on the differentiation. <laughs> There's three things. This is the most complex. The rest of it's going to go, go probably faster, but this one I think is the, probably the most complex and has the, the most changes that the feds have allowed us to really to consider is to reconstruct a number of these systems so that we think they're fairer and they really reflect much better how schools are actually doing. Mike? Do you, you want to, well, let's do that, Nancy, you know, and then Dan, and then push through. Oh, Dan should, should choose that. I'll defer. <laughs> Sorry, you're giving up your spot now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my thanks to my colleague from Lansing. Um, uh, maybe one comment and three questions. Two comments. One is a lot of good thinking has gone into this, obviously. So um, thanks for sharing and, and um, kudos on a lot of hard work. Um, second comment is that overall um, target proficiency. Uh, so I haven't heard you say exactly how you would set that. I mean, we've got the example here at 85%, but that would seem to be quite a bit of the ball game. Um, and so I'm just interested in what your thinking is on that, on where that might be, why, so on and so forth at this stage of the game, understanding that we're still a couple of months away from submission, and then a couple of questions. Okay. Um, well, we've actually had a couple of rounds of feedback where people said 85% may not be enough. And 
at the same time we look at uh, we look at the rigor of our cut scores and we think uh, well, maybe it maybe it is the the real difficulty there is setting something that is attainable and yet rigorous if you go back and you look at for example mathematics there are very few schools that have been able to attain 85 percent we're saying 10 years out you should be able to do that so we know that 85 percent is quite rigorous and one of the things that we might want to really think about is, um, and I had a note passed from Mike it's reminding me of this, um, that we probably want to go back in every couple of years and reevaluate whether or not we have set up a system that is attainable and whether it's rigorous enough. So that we might start with something to begin with just to say, okay, we've got to start somewhere. Um, and see whether or not that maintained, we're able to actually see uh, schools being able to make that kind of progress over time. Um, but setting that 85% or 90% or 95% or 80%, whatever it is, I think is, is worth a lot of discussion. It's particularly something that I think um, we've had a lot of discussion with our stakeholders and we would like to have some kind of discussion with this group. Uh, given that we see you know, 75%, the 95th percentile is around 52% here, with, um, with mathematics, what's high enough? What's too high? It, I think that's a really good question. And I think we come down to, um, in some ways, uh, an issue of perception. Is 85%, is it okay for us to say 15% of students in the schools will not be college ready? Is it okay for us to say 20%? Is it okay to say 5% 10 years from now? What is a reasonable target? And we kind of settled on 85% because it's pretty high. It is rigorous. We've seen some schools do it, even though it's a very, no, a very small number of schools. And one of the questions that we would ask also is, do we set something different for mathematics than we set for reading for that ultimate goal? Or do we really say we really want 85% or we really want 95%? So that's a really long-winded way, I guess, to say we need your help in coming to what we think ought to be those ultimate targets. What are some thoughts on that, John, and Dan, and um, Eileen? And the, I wanted to try to say similar things at the end, but this, this is kind of the meat of it. Um, and I guess the major point is I don't know exactly what to think, but these are really, really important issues. So one of the requests, I guess, in order to help all of us think um, thoughtfully <laughs> about the answers to those questions, seeing the, the critique that people are giving to these proposals, the feedback you're getting from stakeholders, not just, I mean, not just because it helps us frame, boy, if they don't like it, it must be good, you know, but to really see what, how people are reacting to, will help us and me. I mean, on some of the big issues, first off, I agree with Dan, you've done a, a very thoughtful framing here a very thoughtful approach and we're all serious about trying to understand it and and figure out how right it is and how it might be tweaked. Um, you know, some of the key issues I always care about, as you know, are we, in, we're, we're bringing a new category, naming of schools, priority schools, focus schools, are we creating another parallel structure or are we aligning it with, you know, the, the lowest 5% are our priority, priority schools? I think what you proposed here seems to really knock out a pretty clear alignment, which is good. On the big issue of, you know, are we losing something by not paying attention to the demographic subgroups? Because, um, you know, at the heart of No Child Left Behind was this insistence that we care about the learning for Hispanic and African American and special education students. It may not have worked effectively to do it that way. This may be a better way, but I just don't know you know, if this approach is going to get us further towards that goal of not leaving any of those kids behind. So I would very much welcome what you're hearing, what people are thinking about and ask for help on, whether that we're answering that question right. And the same with this last issue. I mean, I may be alone in the universe thinking the 100% proficiency target was the right target always, because that is the right target always. Mm -hmm. It is the right expectation, and it doesn't mean you're um, a master mathematician, it means you're proficient with the basic competencies to take the next step to go to college or life or work. So um, whether this target or any target and achievement towards a target 
is the right recipe. Again, I don't know. It may be, it may be a, the right approach. We do need to wrestle with it, and I appreciate this effort to do it since the first time we've all seen this. I don't know what to say, whether it's right or wrong. Uh, I just would welcome a lot of um, inputs into that analysis. I'd like to hear the critiques of the stakeholders, and maybe as we bring this back, I hope in January, maybe before then, informed by here's what people are saying about this game plan as you're laying it out, it would help me at least. Again, not just in reaction against people. You know, I know if, you know, if they like it, I like it, but to really help, what are people, how are they wrestling with it? Eileen, Dan. Okay, I'm sorry. I'll try. I'll try and be quick. Um, I, so it's it's really tricky. I'm I'm actually with John. Uh, so maybe there are two of us alone in the universe that think 100% is the right target. My my issue is just so who decides what 15% of kids get left behind? And inevitably, whoever's making that decision. And I hate to be this blunt about it, but inevitably. It's the black and brown kids who get left behind. Um, and so I'm just not willing to allow us to set a bar low enough to allow us to ignore black and brown kids and what happens to them in our educational system. That having been said, it's quite clear that the, the brunt of kind of consequences for failing to reach this bar fall most heavily on schools serving black and brown kids, which causes further disruption, so on and so forth. Um, uh, so the, the differentiated supports that would that would um, flow out of kind of failure to meet AYP, I think is an important and critical part of this discussion. We haven't gotten there yet, but um, I think you have to talk about those two together. I think in setting what the right bar is, you've got to talk about what the supports are that would you know, flow from not getting over the bar. Um, and I'm also, just for the record, uh, those who um, argue that uh, uh, placing greater resources into um, uh, schools in need of those, that have de evidenced greater need for those resources because of lower performing student um, or lower uh, achieving student scores, um, and that, that somehow that is rewarding low performance, I think missed the greater notion that nobody wants to send their kid to a low performing school. Uh, and so that, just that notion um, I, I think is, is detestable, frankly. Um, in any event, I'll get off that high horse. Three questions. Um, first, uh, so you mentioned, you mentioned this just now for the first time. The differentiated um, proficiency target is set for a 10-year horizon? We're, we're talking about setting that differentiated target for a 10-year horizon and then intermittently coming back and asking ourselves whether or not that was a reasonable um, target for us to set are we actually seeing schools being able to set, meet these targets in, in some way? Um, and so it would have, uh, obviously from the chart, a, a, there's a much higher um, improvement target that gets set for the lower performing schools because the proficiency target is the same for all over the same horizon. So as opposed to um, I just want to make sure I have this right, no thought yet on whether it's kind of no reaction to it. But as opposed to setting a 20-year target for a school that was performing extremely low um, so that the improvement targets were a little more attainable, um, we set a 10-year target for it, just like we would for, a, say, a medium-performing school. Medium-performing school has improvement targets that are more attainable because they're both set on 10-year horizons. Now, did you think about different horizons for different schools? We hadn't. That's, a, that's an intriguing idea, I think. Um, I, want, I want to clarify that these that you see up on the screen are the proficiency targets. So there's a trajectory of, incre of increasing proficiency targets, but that improvement target is yet another way to get there, which is looking at the 90th percentile or so uh -oh. of schools how much they were able to improve over time okay. and, and setting that as the improvement target. So you would be able to make both, this, you would have the first cut at AYP or first cut at this replacement for AYP would be, did they make this set of proficiency targets? So for school A, 17% is their proficiency target for 2014? Right. Oh, so I see. Okay. Okay. That's and then the, their improvement target, if they don't make that, their improvement target would be essentially um, three and a half. Three and a half or whatever it is that is the 90th percentile. Okay. Um, 
It might be interesting to play with it over different horizons. I'm just wondering what yeah, what might Yeah, I think it's an intriguing idea. idea. Um, uh, last question on the uh, so on the slides with the color coding, the report cards, if you will, mm -hmm. um, are the uh, other factors in graduation rate weighed the same as the achievement factors, or are we talking here that this is yellow? If you have no more than two reds, is it anywhere, or is it only in the achievement factors? Our current thinking is anywhere. So, th so that every one of these that gets a color code would weigh e exactly the same as any other. Okay. Once again, so thanks for good thinking, and you know, I'll have to digest and so on. I think it was Eileen, and I've lost track here again. Um, seeing seeing the numbers is always daunting for for everybody, uh, staff for having designed them, and the board for trying to convey them. Um, uh, in addition to what you do, but I want to I want to say a couple of things. First of all, um, I was at the Michigan Higher Education Compact meeting recently and had a chance to talk to the community college representatives from Michigan. The state auditor general says that our remediation rate for community colleges is below 25 percent. Actually, I think it was 27 percent, 28 percent. They're adamant that it's 80 percent. That 80 percent of the kids that they have in community college in Michigan right now are going through developmental programs of some sort, and. Uh, they decided the achieving the dream work, but uh, Chronicle Philanthropy says that after five years of doing that, that very few kids are still completing developmental programs. So uh, we have to fix this in K-12. We, we, they, they are fixing it yet in community colleges. They've been working at it for seven years nationally. So that's one issue. Um, another one is that I think that you said uh, when you're working with ACT that there's not much difference between a four years non-selective college uh, a uh, cut score for uh, showing um, for, for admittance than right. for a community college in a degree granting program, in a non development program. Right. Is that the, accurate? The, um, the cut scores, when we looked at four year versus two year institutions, were slightly different. The two year institution cut score was slightly lower, but not low enough that we could actually really distinguish it because they were within measurement error of each other. Okay. So that means that we've got 20% of the community college kids who are at a par. With, the, with our state universities and our, I mean, that's a, a real rough draw, but I mean, it's a pretty low number for the kids who are out there. And I don't know how many college kids we admit per year in Michigan schools. So, um, and the, I just, I feel um, very strongly that we have to set these rates really high. I, I, and I feel awful about it because I know the stress <laughs> it's gonna create for our schools and I know the challenges that families are gonna be looking at, but I don't see another way to get us where we need to go. And the, it would underscore my personal privilege in items, agenda item C when I point out that the NAEP it could be given here for the 12th grade uh, preparedness uh, um, level in 2013 on a, on a state, state basis, which I think is important because it would act as a balance. We've been working on trying to figure out whether we can show preparedness for seven careers from a licensed practical nurse to auto mechanic. So that would be, I think, helpful, and actually a much higher ones too. College, college ready. Thanks. Okay. What's what's next? Though? Well, given the time, I would suggest that we take a pause. Uh, okay, we can pick up the differentiated recognition, the differentiated and, and, supports. And can I say this so I don't feel uncomfortable with it the whole lunch? Because this is just the way the rules are, and I'm, it's awkward to say to a board that employs one. <laughs> but. They have, they purposely worked this out where they require one signature and one signature only, and it's a state superintendent or equivalent. And the reason is that they want to hold someone kind of accountable that you really believe this is the best shot that this makes sense for your kids. And so, of course, you know, the reason I'm saying this is I know there was, there's some thinking about if we could have had this further in advance. I mean, absolute worst case, we. I wouldn't want to get to this, but absolute worst case, we wouldn't have to do February. We could try to do the third date. I think there'd be problems with that. And I don't want to not, but, I, but you know, to me, I'm sitting back listening because my name's on this. So the 100%, 85%, which clearly and respectfully uh, not only appreciate the dialogue, but ultimately I'm kind of accountable for what that is and that's why I think in the spirit of what John's even saying you know we're trying to do the best we can too to understand where the stakeholders are we will do just what John suggested try to share that as best we can but um, but I, I just want to clarify it's not 
this is the part that can sound disrespectful and not meant to be. I mean, it's not a vote thing. It's to do this, what we're doing now, because there's a lot of insights we got today. Sometimes it was the easy insight, which is a bunch of these all at once. The more difficult one that I'd like, you know, we should talk more about is, is clearly the 8,500 as an example. And I, mean, I, I sure don't want to sit on that one alone. I think that's really important. I, so where I'm pushing this a little bit is that worst case, we can postpone this if, if we feel like we're not making enough progress in February. But what I, but. Um, at some point it would be good that what are the major points that kind of you think we should be really clear about and try to, as best we get, can get some consensus on. And I mean, I think a good example is 8,500 uh, or, or some in between. And, and because part of it is it's so voluminous. I mean, we've struggled with this at Soup's group. This, these guys, and I really appreciate your mentioning this because this team has done, led by Sally, but three parties and others who've been at, uh, numerous webinars, not to mention the physical time when you went to Chicago and came back and said, man, this isn't going to be something we can just throw together for, what was that first date, November? November 14th. 14th. And, and you know, now we're all getting a flavor of why it's really, but it is, as John kind of said earlier, it might be the most important thing we do for a long time. So I'm trying to find that in between where we have the proper and, and discussion, mm -hmm. take the right stakeholders. And can I just say, I appreciate that very much. And, uh, you know, part of why I appreciate us all taking the time and trying to inform this is, as you know, you know, it really is setting kind of the learning expectations and game plan for our state for the foreseeable future. Right. And so it's very right. important that we all um, be on a page and um, think it's the you know, best one we can put forward. Um, and I, I was just suggesting it's really hard to give as thoughtful input to your, right. you know, recommendation right. here, um, as as we want, uh, given the, just the first we heard about it, how do we expeditiously do that? You know, we need help to figure out so that we're flagging the big issues where we may be encouraging some uh, change. I'm very, you know, comfortable, and I'm sure the board is. Um, ultimately, your strong recommendation of what this needs to look like, you know, is what we would uh, be eager to support or say. How do we differ fundamentally? And we're trying to get there, you know. Right. Right. And so I think uh, how we get there quickly and so we can meet the target is, is, is not easy, but I appreciate everybody's good efforts to do that. Okay. Eileen, please. And then Marianne, please. Uh, knowing that that NAEP thing isn't developed fully yet, uh, but I would ask whether there's a range of uh, cut scores that. Uh, that you can quantify with the work that ACT did with you, with the, with the department. Sorry, Dr. Joseph. Um, I, that uh, indicates community college preparedness without developmental courses. Because that seems to me to be, when you look at K through 16 right now, the pipeline is stuck for those kids in community college. And what we've got to try and figure out how to do in K-12 is to make it so that kids can get on to at least a two-year or some sort of technical or training program, whether it's one year or more. And I think there's a threshold, a bottom threshold on, on that number that I would like to see. If it's 65%, I would like to at least know that. If it's 85%, then that drives a certain conversation that we're having already. Um, I was recommending why don't we get through this by one and then have a half-hour lunch and re get started again just so we get through the whole thing and can figure out what to do with it. One thirty. Would that? Okay. Thank you. Good. Okay. So the next part is uh, slide thirty-six, and now we move into the differentiated recognition. And Linda, you're going to take this on. Right? Yes. Um, I should recognize that other other team members, Mike Bradkey and his staff, and some others have worked on this component uh, more so than my team. But it's something that we're going to have to work into, um, into across the board, and all of us work together on. And when we say differentiated recognition, it's just that it's one of the differentiated tools. The recognition system itself is not differentiated in any way. So, uh, what could we do? And you'll note that it says as funds allow, because in the guidance to us, we're supposed to take some extra funding that occurs <laughs> in Title One and utilize that to provide financial rewards or recognition of some sort. And as Mike Rackey will point out to you, our Title I funding is either flat, 
funded or headed in a downward trend. So there will be no money that we can attach to this in, in the sense of Title I dollars that we can use to use and do this. So we're trying to think of recognition models that will allow us to do exactly that, recognize schools, but it won't attach to a lot of expenditure. What might we do? Uh, certainly in the annual education report, we can make note of the fact that this is a reward school. We will distribute the list to the media and encourage coverage locally. We already are and will continue with this new category to recognize the schools at state conventions, such as uh, any MDE sponsored conferences, such as the um, School Improvement Conference. We would <coughs> encourage education organizations to do sponsored conferences or recognize these schools in some way. We would like to find the funds to do something with audio or video documentaries for 20 or 40 of the schools that we could use as models around the state and then post them out as promising practices. That will take us locating the dollars to support that. Um, we have had uh, commitments by state officials to uh, visit reward schools and the governor is willing to put it in his calendar for one reward school. I don't know how to determine which one, but you know. Uh, send them out to uh, some, and Mike is willing to add that to his list of visits. We would like to network the reward schools with the demographically similar low performing schools. Currently we're trying to take the, high, uh, the um, beating the odds school and, and combine them and work them against the uh, persistently low achieving schools. And so what might we do in a similar fashion with this group? And provide certificates or banners to the reward schools. Once again, certificates we can do relatively easily, but banners, once again, we're getting into how do we generate dollars to do that. And finally, to seek corporate or philanthropic sponsors for recognition activities. So that's how we're going to proceed at this point in time to try and find the, the support to the recognition. That's recognition. And this has been subject to a visit of the chair. You're hearing from schools on what they might buy outside of money. Yes, correct. It's been shared uh, in several meetings that we've had across the street. Obviously, they'd like money, but <laughs> what else might we do? Yes, we could, and we're happy for that input. If you're all up for making some visits, we'll be happy to have you go visit. Yeah, I think that's good. That would be good in alignment awesome. with these. Schools really appreciate it when any of you that end of the table show up. So they appreciate it when you show up too, Linda. I, noticed that. Well, I think that they get a lot more excited when it's you. Deb, they're worried about it. <laughs> Moving right along, differentiated supports. Yes, so, for differentiated supports, we right along. have uh, two categories. I would like to just say to you that we've been focusing primarily on the priority and the focus categories, but also to be determined and to be designed will be the schools that are not making AYP. What do we do to support them that's different from what we do for all schools? Right now, our focus is on um, the differential supports, so it has to address the needs of the schools. And what we discover is frequently the support systems aren't personal enough. We, we have a, a, a model, and we put them all through that model. And so while we would still propose putting them through that model, we would propose a variety of on and off ramps to help them pick those tools that would best meet their needs. We must build the capacity at both the school and the district level because we would really like to work ourselves out of the job and those partners that we have at ISDs and other places. We need to have schools able to do this work without us at some point and districts able to guide the work without us at some point. So we eventually would like us not to have to do this work down the road. Here's the biggest piece, moving schools rapidly from low achievement to high achievement. Joseph showed you the, um, the, the models. And probably our biggest challenge and the one that we're still seeking a lot of input on is how do we gain rapid, sustained growth? How do we go from what is essentially a battleship and turning it around to a speedboat and turning it around? And we know that the research tells us that the battleship model is what is more practical for schools and more apt to occur. And what we're looking for is rapid, sustained growth, even over the 10 year period. How do we get 8 to 9% growth a year? every year for 10 years. And that's our challenge. We are looking at um, some models such as uh, Harvard has done a study on schools that turn themselves around rapidly and have maintained it over four and five years. So we're looking at those models. We're working with the Center for Improvement and Instruction, I'm sorry, Innovation and Improvement uh, that 
who've already utilized their pace setter schools models in schools and found some success with it. We currently have five districts, not necessarily priority districts, uh, working with a new district pace setter model in order to help them change what's going on and develop procedures and practices that will sustain high growth. And we have asked them and they have agreed that they'll, they're putting together a, a board's model. So what does the school board need to do in order to be a pace center school board? And we're going to talk with them and uh, MASB, School Boards Association, to see if we can't pilot a, a model here in the state for the pace center for boards. Because we know that boards and districts play a big role in whether or not that building can make a change. If the systems aren't in place at the district level, and if the <coughs> systems aren't in place at the school board level, the, the building is really struggling to make the change, and then to make it rapid and sustained will complicate the factor. If I may just add to that, even discussions along these lines at board meetings regularly can change the whole dynamic of what schools within that district are doing. They're, they're getting signals from their board about what's important based on what they're discussing. And if it's, if it's less important stuff, and in some districts it is, and never deal with this, then it's kind of a signal no matter what the green and yellow and red says that uh, don't worry about it. So I mean that model with MASP and Kathy's up to it. We're, we're waiting for CII, the, the center, to give us a little bit more uh, guidance in order to approach Kathy and then uh, bring her on board. CII is a center for innovation and improvement. Okay. It's one of the uh, one of the centers that's funded by the federal government, and they're located in the Middle West. Um, but we've had some good good results with them, and uh, are quite impressed with some of the work they're doing. It's one of the, I think, five centers that the federal government funds. Um, the opportunity is that we can begin to think outside the box and what what might work that we aren't already trying. That's where we would, any ideas or models that you have or thoughts that you have, we would welcome them because we clearly have got to make a change in a hurry. For the priority schools then, um, we need to be sure that we continue to align the persistently low achieving schools and the school improvement grant initiatives with this work. Um, Joseph has alluded to it, uh, deaf staff and our work, our group work consistently to try and make the message the same and try to make the supports as, as congruous as we can and we will need to continue to do that with this group. Schools by the federal uh, guidance must utilize one of the four reform models that you already were familiar with, turnaround, transformation, restart, or closure. Um, we want to have them be a little more focused on um, making that selection based on a data workshop so that the selection is not just um, based on some conversations around the table. Uh, we would Then we would propose that we would also ask them to take a look at the survey of an active curriculum and we are putting we have put together rubrics to help them determine whether or not the principal might remain in place and we might not have to replace them. Uh, we've had staff working on that and we have a model completed and we're going to begin to take a look at it in some actual school districts to see how it works. Uh, school permit review is another process that we take schools through. And let me just pause right there and tell you that a couple of those pieces are new to our model and that's because the federal government announced this model of this change, this possibility for change, about 10 days before we started a brand new model that we spent all of last year working on. And so a lot of this you will see is not new to the model we currently have, but it's a brand new model. Um, intermediate school district support continues and we will continue to keep a focus on content leadership co coaches because the research tells us that that's one way to make fast gains in schools and sustain that support in the schools. We will utilize the current, the current tools that are on the Advanced Ed website for school improvement. Our challenges in the priority schools is that the number of schools goes up, and so we're going to have to provide the supports to more schools than we ever have before. We think that we need to look at how we're going to get at more trained turnaround specialists. That's a, a new field, and we're going to have to work on getting some trained people in place. And I would just reemphasize the district capacity has got to be there to support it. So that's got to be one of the full sides of this model as we put it together. So 
the priority schools. Focus schools is a new category we've not had to work with before, and the numbers are um, quite high, so that we're going to have to look at our focus being on the district level, and not in the uh, not the, so much the building level. Once again, we'll look for database decisions, and this gets uh, to some of your concerns about what are we going to do with subgroups, and this would be utilized at that level and help them analyze their data. We think that we want to build a lot of this work around response to the response to intervention model that seems to resonate with the districts, and uh, something that they could utilize that is just good instructional modeling and help them get good at that. We would want to build in a strong monitoring component because this could easily get lost without that. And our challenge, once again, is the number of schools in the district capacity. So that takes care of the second of the four principles. Uh, that was a long one. I warned you it was going to be a long one. Uh, the, next two, the next one uh, is, is a little bit easier just because there's some things in legislation. The fourth one, as I mentioned, was the burdensome reports. We've already taken care of that one, so we won't even cover that one. But Joseph, you want to kind of walk us through the education sure. evaluations? So requirements um, for flexibility, we need to demonstrate that guidelines that can be adopted by the state education agency for districts to follow, we have to have those in place. We need to be able to explain the process of ensuring that uh, districts adopt high quality systems. Uh, we have our current thinking is well, legislative requirements already say you have to do this, um, but um, it does not put anything in place that is a statewide requirement, a statewide system. And that's really what the Governor's Council on Educator Evaluation is tasked with doing is putting together something that would become a statewide system to go back to the legislature. The challenges that we have really surround timing. The first meeting of the Governor's Council on Educator Effectiveness is this. Uh, Wednesday, tomorrow, and um, 15 meetings scheduled between now and, and the deadline for uh, putting forward recommendations in April. So what that does is it, it puts a little bit of a crimp on the timelines for us in that um, we have to have something in place or we're supposed to have something in place under the education, under the flexibility requirements for the 2011-12 school year. So that puts things on a pretty quick timeline to get something through the legislature. Um, we think that we will be able to uh, address some of those with this is what the plans are. We will not may not necessarily have guidelines in place, but we have plans for getting them in place. Mary, I was asking if this has to go through the legislature. This does not. That particular piece on education, educator evaluation, is with the council, mm -hmm. and they're going to make recommendations. So we're trying to, if they went ahead and did something different than what we could describe to be successful in the waiver, that would be a problem. I think uh, we've talked to Deb while I was chairing this about this. Joseph, I, I'm on it, but delegated it for obvious reasons to Joseph, who's going to uh, <coughs> rearrange the schedule to make this work as best he can. But the, the rest of this, no, the legislature doesn't have anything to do with it. Um, one of the things that <laughs> is really different in the requirements is that they talk about a first year of this educator evaluation system being a pilot. That's not what is in place in, in the legislation that we have, so that's a little bit of a disconnect. Uh, we also have to work with teacher and administrator groups, administrative groups to um, get feedback on this. Again, challenges, the content of this, the way that these things will be done, what the statewide model will look like, it's undetermined. <coughs> And there's really, again, the timing. The timing is a, is a significant challenge. And worst case scenario, again, right? We'd have to, we'd have to shift to the third uh, right. date. You know, I mean, that's not ideal. It puts schools in a very, puts all of us in a very awkward spot. So, we, we talk, and, and I think tomorrow um, there'll be an opportunity. I know they're taking a lot of five-minute presentations, but I think there's an opportunity maybe to get that on the table. How important the deadline is. Group. Yes. Yeah, just, just a quick question on the timing. I don't mean to take too much time, but so we submit in February. What's the what's the rest of the process look like? Is this a back and forth, serve and volley thing for a couple months? Is it a either you succeed or fail? It's so not a succeed or fail. It really is to get everybody to yes. So if we turn it in by February. 21st, they're anticipating that they will have the review teams ready to look at those at the end of March. 
the review team that they've got looking at the 11 that submitted are actually meeting this week in DC. Each of the team members has four states that they're looking at, and they are supposed to complete it by Thursday. So they were moving very fast track. I don't know how quickly they will then get back to the states, but the idea is not it's not a win or lose. It's okay. We still got questions here. We don't think you answered this well enough. You're not here, and then we'll go back and continue to revise until we until we get there. And, and it may be beyond questions. It may be we don't agree with X. Right, and then we and have to we're change. We're not going to support it if you don't modify that. So, but it, it it's a good question because it's different than race to the top, which is up or down. This is. It's, it's another reason why the ideal thing would be to try to make it February and then be able to. Okay. And then just the last couple of slides to talk about how all of this then relates to the school reform and the redesigned schools. Linda? Just very quickly, the good news is that uh, all of this work will try to align it with the primary schools so that the best work in our local <coughs> is the same. It will not impact any of the current law regarding the high priority schools. The good news is it does provide support for the Title I schools. You know, Congress of that is its own financial support for the non title one schools that we have to work with. Once again, our challenge is to think outside the box and then to figure out how we can support non title one schools that are priority schools. So, in conclusion, the, the core team here at the department, uh, in addition to Joseph and Linda, is Mike Radke, Deb Clemens is over there. Um, and Vanessa Kiesler and, and Abby Groff. So those are the team members that are really trying to move this forward. As I mentioned, the stakeholder, we will continue to meet with various stakeholder groups. Uh, some of the ones that were at the meeting on the 28th, as I mentioned earlier, actually volunteered to continue meeting with us as we kind of plow through these issues and look at the consequences unintended or, or not. Uh, and we'll continue to revise it until we get ready to put it in for the, hopefully by the February 21st. And Linda alluded to the Center for Innovation and Improvement. We've got some technical assistance from a number of, of national groups that are willing to work with us. So we're kind of running ideas by them, and they're giving us feedback. And they've got an idea of what the other states have submitted and are talking about. And then, as I mentioned, you know, toward the middle of the third week of January, CCSSO, the chief's group, will have another technical assistance. Well, they'll take a look at our draft and give us feedback on, how, on what it looks like. And we should we may know by then what the feds are approving from the first 11 states. So, Mike. Um, John uh, mentioned earlier um, the possibility of getting uh, access to that feedback. Um, is there any way for us to be able to do that? Yeah, we've got the chart pads. I think they're about ready to be typed up. So yeah, yeah. So we've got uh, we can certainly send that stuff to. You. We can certainly send that, that to you. Great. Thank you. And thank you for all your work, President. Thanks. You know, this is, this is a little self-serving for the department, but not for me personally. I mean, when Lois comes and Sandy and I see Judy and Bruce and certainly Carolyn, but people who listen in, I think, I think that some folks in the department get a bum rap, and I wish others could see the kind of thought that goes in on behalf of the districts. This is really for the districts. I mean, there's no gain for the department as such. And I think even if there may be, uh, in final decision, a little disagreement on X or Y, I, I, just a personal hope is I hope more people are watching. I know a lot of the association leaders actually watch more than I realize. They used to come. Remember, it's the one downside of the internet in the sense you don't really know who's, who's on. Hi. But, uh, <laughs> but I appreciate those that come religiously and, and They've been stakeholders in this, but it's also just something to show, I think, good faith that this has been very difficult for folks, in addition to their regular work, to try to put this together. And you can see the complexity of it. And, and even people who don't always agree with the department would, I think, kind of say, well, you know what, got to give them a shout out, as you've all done, for, uh, for efforts on our behalf as districts and as schools. I, we were trading notes on process, and maybe after lunch we could just quickly reiterate some process steps to move forward because I want to make sure we're all we're in sync on that. Dan? Uh, really quickly, just in the spirit of getting you timely feedback um, on two things I've had a chance to think about. One is, I think we heard from the folks at the Denver Public School District that it was Colorado that had gone to a green, yellow, red system. Um, and my recollection was that their feedback, they, it, it wasn't working great. I, and I don't remember why that was, but I just encourage you to take a, just Contact your peers in Colorado. Yeah, I'd, I'll double check and make sure that's right, but I do think it was Colorado. Um, 
Uh, that's one. Two is, um, I, so I still don't know about the, what the proficiency target should be, but the other reason around, the other reason that 100% makes sense to me from a moral and ethical perspective is that it really provides, um, uh, it requires that we uh, share one another's fate. Um, uh, and I think in this endeavor where the state constitution requires that we provide public education to all, and while it doesn't set a standard around it, uh, unlike some other states like New York say, um, I just, I think the notion of shared fate here is one that um, is appropriately placed. Uh, so I, I, I don't know what to do with that, you know, in practice around this, um, uh, but I left it up just as another something to think about, I suppose. Thanks, Dan. Well, thank you. This has been excellent. We'll, we'll do a little bit more after lunch. We'll, for those in the audience, we're going to take about a, at 1.30, we're going to return, and I think we'll move right to public participation for those. That, that's the timing we usually have for that, for those who've come. I think some people are here to take John away, it looks like. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure what that's I'm about. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so our guests will be back at 1.30, and 